And it's my pleasure and privilege to invite Professor Simon Ung from the Chinese University in Hong Kong to introduce the webinar. Simon, welcome. Thank you very much, Dion. So hello, friends and colleagues. It is my greatest pleasure to welcome you all to the education and training webinar hosted by the NIHR Global Health Research Unit on Global Surgery, focusing on the recently completed EGO Safe Anastomosis Study. Now, the EGO study is the first and largest international cluster randomized study led by the European Society of Coloproctology and the NIHR Global Surgery Unit at the University of Birmingham. Now, with an objective to reduce the incidence of anastomotic leak after right hemicolectomy, the EGO study is the first of its kind interventional study, which has adopted a multi-pronged approach to alter the behavior of the surgeons and the surgical team so that they may perform a safer anastomosis for the patients. Now, at the end, the study has recruited close to 3,500 patients from, across the world, from 61 countries and 355 hospitals, and over 2,700 surgeons were involved. And overall, 24% were actually from the global south. Now, in today's webinar, there will be three key presentations on the background, the research design, and also the headline results of the EGO study. Now, there will be a breakout sessions looking at two key perspectives of the research, namely research methodology and results, and also process evaluation. Now, the webinar will conclude with a roundtable discussion of global experts discussing how these results can be implemented uh, around the globe and to impact on surgical practice. Now, I hope you would find the program educational and useful to your clinical practice and research. Now, without further ado, I will now pass you over to Professor Dion Morton, the director of the NIHR Global Surgery Unit and the PI of the EGO study, who will introduce the next session. Thank you, Dion. Uh, thank you for that fantastic overview and introduction, Simon. Um, so the first question that we want to address today is, should we, why are we looking at anastomotic leaks as a as an issue for surgeons and what evidence did we have to look at this? And it's my huge pleasure to invite Professor Ala El Hussani to talk about the original cohort studies performed by the European Society of Coloproctology that prompted this work. Uh, over to Professor Ala El Hussani. The idea of uh, doing an uh, audit, prospective uh, audit, uh, came in 2013, and it was uh, inspired uh, by collaborative work that has been already done in United Kingdom uh, and produced uh, some uh, very well uh, scientific uh, studies. So the idea was discussed during the uh, European Society of Coloproctology meeting in 2013, and then the cohort study or the nucleus of the cohort study was constructed uh, during the 2014. Nine different researchers from different parts of the world to join the cohort studies committee, and the first audit was about uh, right hemicolectomy. So why right hemicolectomy? Well. This is a procedure that's been done uh, uh, frequently in, in different parts of the world. So it is not a complex uh, procedure. It has been done or can be done by the trainees and by the specialist. Uh, so it is uh, well situated uh, to be the procedure of choice. And, and the idea was to have the prospective snapshot, uh, a snapshot about what is the variations in patient's demography in Europe at that time, well, the ESCB didn't have this global reach that we had it. So our aim was to focus on Europe. So what were the variations in patients' uh, in patients' uh, uh, demographics? What were the variations uh, in in surgical techniques? Uh, how how we were defining the right hemicolectomy? And our aim was to collect uh, one thousand procedure. Uh, with this sample size, we thought we can map the variations and we can see how to tackle any uh, issues uh, based on this 
And what was very interesting at that time, there was no internet uh, meetings. So it was, they were the telephone conferences, but difficult to, uh, to hear, but uh, it has been done and was very well received. So many papers were uh, published based on the uh, snapshot audit in 2014. The first and main paper was about anastomotic technique. The paper concluded that there were higher rates of leak and stable anastomosis than to hands-on anastomosis. Then followed by other papers, uh, subgroup papers examining Crohn disease, cancer, and a paper examining the difference between a specialist and trainee doing the stable anastomosis. And here comes the, the conclusion that uh, inspired the educational model of the, of the e eagle, because we can see that uh, specialists, colorectal specialists, uh, uh, have lower rate of anastomotis, anastomotic leak. So it is not, or, that the hypothesis was, it's not about the stable anastomosis itself, but how we are doing the stable anastomosis. So this led us to, to think about if we train the trainees and the, the uh, different surgeons to do the stable anastomosis or do the anastomosis uh, in following a protocol, which uh, uh, started with step-by-step -step protocol, then maybe we can change the, the results. And that was the, uh, the idea of the EGLE study. Thank you, Ala. That's a fantastic uh, resume of what was a very exciting piece of work. I'd like to welcome our panel for the first discussion. Uh, Amrit Pipara is a surgeon from the Tata Memorial, the Tata Hospital in Kolkata. Welcome, Amrit. And Nicolas Avalendada is also a surgeon, but from Buenos Aires in Argentina. Welcome, both of you. Uh, perhaps start with Nicolas from South America. Nicolas, what is your perception that uh, we need to investigate? anastomotic leaks. Is this seen as an important area of study for surgeons in South America? Uh, hi, good morning and thank you for inviting me. I think that anastomotic leakage is a very important aspect for colorectal surgery. It's most feared complication that we surgeons have. And we in Latin America, we have an extra a bonus track to investigate this, which is that we have absolutely no information on what's happening in the region. That's why Eagle has been very, very important for us. Thank you, Nicholas. Amrit in Kolkata, is anastomosis and the fashioning of anastomosis an important issue for colorectal surgeons in India? Uh, yes, good afternoon, everyone. Yes, it's a very important issue for us also because most of our patients actually pay from their pocket and if they have an anastomotic leak, it leads to quite a bit of economic implications for them since the government schemes are just coming into the play and trying to help them out. So it's good for us to know as to what is causing a leak and whether we can improve those things and have a better format in place. And that's why I think the Eagle has been very good and helpful for us to put in a, a format before we do an anastomosis. Amrit, I think you've raised an important point there, and that is the anastomotic leak is not just a problem for surgeons dealing with it in hospital, but it's a problem for patients and families and has long-term disbenefit to everyone. Um, yes. Looking at the original audit, uh, Ala, you were, you were emphasizing how uh, there was great heterogeneity, diversity in what people were doing. Is that a reason for doing a study, do you think? Sure. Just take, for example, what is right hemocolectomy? Because people were defining right hemocolectomy in different ways. So what we have done in this audit, we made a diagram, said, what do you mean by right hemocolectomy? Where do you have the, the proximal uh, margin? Where is the, the, uh, uh, the distant margin of the right hemocolectomy? And it was really amazing to see that it is called right hemocolectomy. 
but there were different types of right hemicolectomy. So what we found is there was, I think there were nearly 20 different ways people were performing an anastomosis. And we thought this can't, they can't all be right, can they? They can't all be the best way. Surely we should be working together. And we think that surgeons working together can improve the care for their patients. I'm going to go back to Nicolas in Buenos Aires. Nicolas, uh, if, if there is, if we carry out these very big studies across the world, these rapid cohort studies, these snapshot audits, what, why do you think they're valuable? Is it something we should be continuing? Well, actually, uh, I've seen this a number of times, but uh, Eagle for us has been a real game changer because not only uh, um, it had massive participation from our region, but also it, it was a kick start for us for our own core studies. Therefore, I think it's uh, very, very important that these type of studies continue happening and, con and also continue involving not only hospitals from Europe, but also from other, other parts in the world. And Amrit, perhaps I could come back to you in Kolkata. Did, are surgeons in India keen to participate in research in your experience? Do surgeons want to undertake studies? But I think in general, most of the surgeons will not be very keen and proactive about surgi uh, surgeries. They'll be doing surgeries, but nobody knows what happens to the patients or what is the, what does the data look like. So I think this thing is slowly changing and more and more surgeons are actually willing to be a part of study to see how they can improve the overall patient outcomes, actually. Yes, I think, Amrit, it's an important point. Surgeons are starting to be much more active in research, aren't they? They're much more interested in improving the care for their patients. And I think that there is a, a lead article coming out in the Lancet about how surgical research has changed over the last 20 years. And uh, I think it's really important that surgeons now understand that we can work together to improve care for our patients. Now, before we go to the next talk, I just want to come back to Allah once more. So Allah, could you explain to me, why did we do a cluster randomized trial why didn't we do a standard randomized control trial with an intervention where every individual patient was randomized to a different procedure? Let us start with the, uh, uh, the practicality. The randomized control uh, uh, trial uh, design is more practical when we, uh, we, we randomize a whole cluster instead of randomizing one patient by one patient. The second thing is this uh, design can deliver real-time uh, data because we are clustering all the cluster and not uh, clustering some one patient by another. Third thing, it reduces the contamination between the intervention and the, the randomization. And, the, uh, and fourth, which is also very important, it is statistically efficient design because uh, it will deliver more precise description of the, the intervention and the effect of intervention. So these are just few uh, issues that inspired us to use or to choose the, this, this type of design. So Allah, that brings us beautifully into the next presentation. So thank you to all of the panel. Thank you, Nicholas. Thank you, Amrit. Thank you, Allah, for your wonderful overview. Um, we're now going to listen to uh, a senior statistician from here in Birmingham. Our senior statistician in the Global Surgery Unit is Omar. And Omar is going to talk to us now about the, uh, the methodology and how it can be applied if for surgical patients. So, Omar, welcome. And we're looking forward to your discussion about the methodology around e the Eagle study. Thank you. Uh, like, like Dion mentioned, I'm going to briefly mention about the study design um, of EGLE. Um, I won't sort of go through all the details because we have the methodology uh, breakout as well, where we'll talk more about uh, some of these designs. But uh, uh, yeah, so EGLE was designed as a, as a dog-like design. And initially, this design was uh, sort of meant uh, for individually patient randomized uh, uh, trials, not for sort of cluster trials. 
So this is the original sort of scheme of the design where we have three groups um, being randomized to um, three different um, uh, sequences, if you like. So in the first group, we have uh, patients uh, who, who would receive the intervention and then data will be collected after or assessment will be made after. And then in the second group, uh, so this group here, we we're collecting data uh, before and after the uh, intervention. And then the third group is sort of like the control group where they receive uh, no intervention. Uh, so why is this uh, sort of efficient? Uh, because, you know, especially this second group where we have uh, sort of before and after uh, assessments. In individually patient, randomized uh, patient trials, this is efficient because it reduces variability. We're assessing the same patients before and after. So we have reduced um, noise and variability uh, to consider, and it allows us to, uh, to be able to identify uh, if there is a treatment effect uh, in, a, in a better way. Um, it is referred to as a dog-leg design because of the, the pattern that is formed by these um, three different groups or sequences. Uh, the eagle uh, uh, is sort of, um, sort of like a, uh, the dog-leg design is like a hybrid of two different uh, common trial designs, like the crossover trial, where, where your patients receive uh, uh, an intervention and then they have a washout period and then they receive, uh, they switch uh, to another intervention. Uh, and the step which design uh, which is uh, sort of introducing intervention of a, a, a multiple uh, period of time in a staggered approach. So uh, uh, the dog-leg design is a hybrid of this. And this is uh, the design for the EGLE study. Uh, the intervention for EGLE is a quality improvement intervention. And as, uh, as Ala mentioned before, it's a cluster trial, mainly because, you know, because of the intervention. You know, we can't... Uh, ask uh, the surgical team to train uh, on this intervention and then perform it, you know, perform, the, uh, uh, perform the surgery for one patient and then for another patient, they unlearn, you know, they can't unlearn the education. So it's impossible, almost impossible to do it in a uh, individual uh, randomized uh, uh, trial. So this is the, the schema for EGLE where we have, um, uh, again, we have uh, the three groups here uh, uh, named as sequence. Uh, but we had 15, 16 phases. So EGLE was not done in one part. It was broken down into 16 different parts. And this, is, this was one of the major advantage uh, of this uh, design. Uh, this, it, allowed, it allowed us to randomize different hospitals at different uh, time points and allowed us to minimize delays due to government approvals. It allowed us to use uh, data which is routinely, routinely available. It had minimum uh, burden in terms of data collection and follow-up. There was only one follow up at 30 days. Uh, so in terms of patients, uh, we had uh, quite a good uh, uh, follow up rate. It maximized st statistical efficiency because we, are, we, we have, uh, uh, especially the sequence two, where we're collecting data from the same hospitals before and after. So it allows us to make a good uh, treatment um, effect uh, comparisons. And also it ensured that all hosp hospitals are exposed uh, to the quality improvement intervention. You can see, uh, you know, sequence one, they receive the intervention uh, initially. Uh, sequence two, they start off with collecting data and then they receive intervention. And sequence three, they collect data and then afterwards they receive the intervention. So everyone received the intervention and uh, it allowed um, uh, everyone to be, to be sort of um, more happy to participate in EGLE. Thank you, dear. Thank you very much, Omar. And with that overview of the methodology of the trial, uh, thousands of surgeons undertook this study in hundreds of hospitals across the world. And uh, lecturer Elizabeth Lee from here in Birmingham is now going to present the preliminary results of the EAGLE trial to look at how this intervention might impact on patients and their outcomes. So, what we did was um, we did a batched step wedge cluster randomized trial. So for those going into the uh, breakout rooms later, we'll break this down a lot more carefully. But essentially, this is what ended up happening. So we split this up by time based batches. So we had first batch, second batch, and within each batch, all the eligible hospitals were recruited during the recruitment period. Then the ones that were ready were then further randomized into sequence one, two, or three. 
and there was a minimum of 18 hospitals in um, each randomization batch. And this randomization, what that defined was when these hospitals would perform data collection. So when they were randomized to sequence one, they would have the intervention. So in other words, the Eagle safe anastomosis intervention first, then they would do data collection. If they were randomized to sequence two, they would perform data collection first, then they will complete the um, safe anastomosis intervention, and then they will collect data again. And if they were randomized to sequence three, they will collect data which is pre-intervention, almost a bit like a control arm. And this was all amalgamated together. So in other words, they uh, collected data um, at a different period of time. And this meant they either had the intervention or the data collection was almost like a control arm. And then when the next batch of hospitals were um, ready to be randomized, this allowed us more time to actually pragmatically set up and randomize these hospitals and go again. So this diagram only shows the first two batches of randomization. Um, however, this was continued all the way through for the duration of the trial. What we've done is we've called the um, sequences uh, or the patients involved in the data collection post-intervention when they had, data, they had their operation after the surgeons were exposed to the intervention. And we've called them pre-intervention when they had their surgery in a time period before the intervention. So the pre-intervention patients are almost a bit like a control arm of any standard trial. Um, overall, we recruited almost 3,500 patients, but some of these patients were outside of the um, a recruitment window we could not include, and some did not have a primary anastomosis at all. So 3,039 uh, 3, patients were entered into the primary analysis looking at anastomotic leak. This was across 81 countries, um, over 300 hospitals, of which 41% were from uh, lower middle income countries. So it was thank you very much also to um, our collaborators in the hubs and, and the spokes and globally as well. It was a huge push and 2,700 patients engaged with the online modules. I uh, sorry, excuse me, surgeons engaged with the online modules. Our patients were fairly comorbid. So one fifth of them had a high BMI. Uh, one fifth of them had diabetes. And one fifth had um, a history of heart disease, vascular disease or cerebral vascular accidents. And a third of them had a history of smoking. We're looking at the operative characteristics. Um, contaminated uh, or dirty surgery was 14 percent. The rest were clean contaminated. Uh, a quarter of all of our patients were uh, done as an emergency, 46%, uh, so almost half of our patients were ASA 3 to 5, so they were quite comorbid, and just over half of the primary operating surgeon was a consultant colorectal specialist. So when we looked at all of the different phases um, we uh, used each phase as almost like an individual study, and these were all meta-analyzed together. And the overall effect was that this were, there was no conclusive evidence um, statistically that there was a reduction in astomotic leak. So when we look at this a little closer, we can see that the absolute rate of anastomotic leak went from 10.1% to 9.6%, and the odds ratio is 0.88. So there is a signal towards improvement, but this was not statistically significant with the p-value of 0.231. This was after adjustment for a series of different factors and variables, which are often known to confound um, anastomotic leak. We also found that in our secondary um, outcomes, uh, there were no uh, statistically significant um, outcomes that were conclusive again. 
However, the most interesting aspect was when we looked at our subgroup analysis. So one of our pre-planned subgroup analyses was to look at surgeon uptake. And the way that we had defined this is the proportion of surgeons in each hospital that completed the online training modules, as this was data we were able to collect. Now, we found that in the post-intervention group, so in those who um, had uh, the, the surgeons were trained and then the patients had their operation, we found a very strong effect in the percentage of surgeons having completed training in each hospital and the reduction in anastomotic leak. And this was after this was adjusted for various different other patient factors. And this is also statistically significant as well. And you may say, okay, what about the pre-intervention group? What we actually saw in this group was almost the opposite effect. And bearing in mind that it's actually very difficult to comment on this particular effect because these patients had already been operated and the educational modules were offered to the surgeons, but there was no incentive or any reason they had to complete this. And one could speculate, perhaps, that um, those that had a higher anastomotic leak, a uh, higher yeah, anastomotic sorry. leak, may have been uh, more motivated to actually complete the modules. Uh, so this um, this will certainly help us build newer methodology as this uh, eagle is the first generation of these type of studies and um, help us to refine our techniques later. So um, in conclusion, there was no conclusive evidence of a reduction in anastomotic leak overall. However, this is the first genera generation of a brand new novel methodology of applying quality improvement interventions for surgeons and patients across the world. This is open access. It democratizes um, education and also training as well. And we can see from this that the effect was greatest when there was highest engagement from the surgeon. Uh, qualitative analysis is currently being undertaken by my colleague, um, uh, Mary Venn, and will also help us um, uh, pick this apart far better as well. Thank you. Uh, Lizzie and Omar, thank you so much for that overview. And I would just summarise that this study allowed us to work with nearly 3,000 surgeons across the world. That is very unusual for an interventional trial. And it was the design of the trial that let us do that. The second point I would emphasize is the trial has given a strong signal that those hospitals where the surgeons undertook the intervention saw a large reduction in their anastomotic leak rates, whereas those hospitals where they did not undertake the intervention showed uh, no benefit from the trial. So that shows that implementation of the, uh, of the intervention was really important and was actually the key factor in delivering benefit to patients. So for that reason, we now have two breakout rooms. One is on re research methodology, and that is being led by Professor Deirdre Kruger from Witts University in Johannesburg. Welcome, Deirdre. And the second is breakout room. Hi, Deirdre. And the second breakout room is, is on process evaluation. So that's how do we evaluate whether people are actually doing the interventions and using them. And this is being led by Dr. Gag Gagandeep Quatra from the Christian Medical College in Ludhiana, one of the, our hubs in the Global Surgery Network. So to enter the breakout rooms, you're now going to uh, follow the steps on the screen. And if you select your, uh, if you choose uh, your breakout room, you'll be put into that breakout room in the next 30 seconds. If you don't choose a breakout room, then we will put you into a, one of the breakout rooms manually. You'll be the, the breakout rooms will be for 20 minutes and then you'll be automatically returned to the main room. And I look forward to seeing you again then. Thank you.
Good day and welcome to all our delegates attending this research methodology breakout session. I am Deirdre Kruger from the Global Surgery Unit's Education and Training Committee, and I'm joined by a couple of expert contributors to the EAGLE trial, Mr. Omar Omar and Dr. Elizabeth Lee. Mr. Omar is a senior medical statistician and epidemiologist in the Birmingham Clinical Trials Unit, and he was the lead statistician for the EAGLE trial. Dr. Elizabeth Lee is also from the University of Birmingham, where she works as an academic clinical lecturer in surgery. She's also a key member of the Global Surgery Unit, where her research focuses on improving surgical outcomes through collaborative research. Welcome, Omar and Lizzie. So let's get started. Researchers carefully select the appropriate design to obtain reliable and meaningful results in the most efficient and ethical manner possible. The choice of a clinical trial study design is specific to the research question and objective, as well as the population with each design, also having its own advantages and logistic considerations. We have briefly heard about the EGLE trial design, which is a really complex stepped wedge dog leg design. But there are so much more simpler clinical trial designs, such as the individually randomized parallel group, which most of us are familiar with. Omar, can you tell us a little bit about the individually randomized parallel group trials? Yes, thank you, Didri. Um, <clears throat> as you mentioned, um, the parallel group design is you know, the most common design uh, the researchers use. And as you can see um, in the diagram, Participants are randomly assigned to uh, treatment arms or intervention, and then each treatment arm, uh, you know, could include a particular dose or of the study drug, or it could be a placebo, or it could be uh, a standard care treatment. And uh, the main idea is that the patients remain in that same treatment arm throughout the course of the study. And a major part of um, of a parallel group uh, study is called randomization, which uh, is sort of a process to uh, to decide which uh, which of the treatment arms, uh, in this case here, arm A and B, in which of the treatment arms uh, the, uh, the patient uh, will be assigned to. And this ensures accuracy of the results and also lowers uh, the risks uh, of bias. Uh, generally speaking, uh, a placebo or active control uh, are used um, uh, as control groups in parallel studies. Uh, they are very uh, common and you know they're applied in many diseases and allows uh, running of uh, simultaneous uh, treatments you know, assessing simultaneous treatments uh, at the same uh, at the same time thank you omar so in this type of parallel group trial design this is a between subject comparison but this type of design also has its limitations and a within subject comparison might be more appropriate at times. Um, and this would be a crossover trial. So can you explain a little bit more about the crossover trial design and when it should be used? Yes, um, the main challenge of a parallel study design is that people dislike the possibility of receiving a placebo or control group. So it could be a deterrent for them uh, you know, to sign up and participate uh, in a study. So as you can see uh, here, a crossover um, trial is a way of comparing uh, groups um, um, using an approach where you know, patients are, or participants are randomly assigned uh, to one group and then they cross over to another group, um, uh, to another group during the course of the trial. Uh, so this means that you know, even if they're initially put in a placebo or control group, they will eventually receive the study drug or treatment uh, during the trial. And you can see here, you know, we have arm A and arm B. So participants who originally start with arm A, they will, you know, they will start with uh, this group. And then uh, after some time, they will uh, sort of swap over to um, arm B. And often we have uh, what we call a washout period in between which uh, ensures the integrity of, of the study. This is a predetermined uh, 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 amount of time which uh, patients receive no treatment. And this also reduces uh, what we call uh, carryover effects uh, from the previous uh, treatment. And, uh, and it helps us to determine whether the outcome of the study is due to the effect of the, uh, of the treatment. And there are some uh, sort of minor requirements, you know, where, when you when you choose to do a crossover trial. And one of the uh, one of the requirements is that the disease being studied must be chronic, uh, stable, and it must be incurable. 
uh, during uh, ju during the duration of the of the two study period. And also another sort of consideration is that uh, the effect of each drug must not be uh, irreversible. Thank you, Omar. So what would be the main advantages and disadvantages of a crossover trial? Um, the main advantage is typically you require fewer patients uh, uh, compared to a parallel uh, study design. And another advantage is also that the influence of confounding um, uh, of the sort of certain uh, key covariate is decreased because uh, each crossover subject uh, serves as their own control. Uh, but there are sort of uh, one of the main disadvantages that it can take a, a lot longer to complete compared to a parallel study group because uh, each patient you know, will receive multiple uh, treatment during the study period. Thank you so much, Omar. Maybe let's move on to a cluster trial design. What is a cluster trial design, Omar? So in a classical individual uh, patient level trial, uh, patients are allocated to receive either uh, uh, receive an intervention. But in a cluster um, in a, a cluster randomized trial setting, the unit of randomization is a group or a cluster. So you can think of a group or a cluster, you know, it can be a hospital or it can be a school, and everyone in that cluster will receive um, the same intervention. Thank you, Omar. So we previously discussed the cluster design uh, used in the CHEATA trial on surgical site infections. Lizzie, Please briefly remind us what the background of CHEETAH was. CHEETAH was a cluster randomized trial that was looking at a change in gloves and instruments for the surgeon and also the entire surgical team prior to closure of an abdominal wound for uh, over 13,000 patients having abdominal surgery. And the aim was to see if this change in gloves and instruments could reduce the risk of in, uh, surgical site infections in these patients. Thank you, Lizzie. So why was CHEATA designed as a cluster trial instead of a parallel randomized trial? <clears throat> yes, I think uh, one of the main uh, reasons was uh, practicality. Uh, uh, practicality on delivering the intervention. We didn't think that it would be um, feasible for us uh, for, to ask the su surgical team, uh, you know, to change um, uh, instruments and gloves in, in one operation, and then another patient uh, comes in and then, you know, they don't change uh, instruments and gloves. So we didn't think that would be uh, too practical. And uh, Another reason is uh, risk of contamination. And uh, by this, we don't mean uh, sort of surgical wound contamination. We mean that con uh, contamination which occurs when patients uh, don't receive what they were allocated to receive. So for example, uh, if a patient has been uh, uh, received, uh, allocated to receive change of gloves and instruments, and then you know, uh, at the time of operation, this doesn't happen. So uh, this is called contamination. And we, thought that cheetah had a high risk of contamination because the surgical team have a preference or they have a, their usual way of, um, uh, of how they do an operation and whether they change the gloves or not. And we didn't think uh, that applying uh, this intervention uh, in cheetah at a patient level would be feasible. Thank you so much, Omar. Lizzie, as a surgeon, why was the cluster randomized control design most appropriate for cheetah? So uh, again, reflecting what Omar said, the practicality of it was um, much more straightforward. Um, Cheetah required training of an entire group, including all the theatre staff, as well as the surgeons, and agreement in carrying out this activity as well. And this had to be done in um, all consecutive patients that were eligible and presenting to uh, the hospital at that point in time. So um, to ensure that as few patients were as possible were missed and that the entire team were knowledgeable about what was expected of them in theater, planning for the um, uh, instruments as well uh, that was necessary. It was far more easier to um, do this with a cluster randomization where the whole team does the same activity during the entire period of um, the study design. And what that meant was we were able to deliver a very high level of evidence with over 98% um, uh, data accuracy um, in this trial. And it made it robust and also made it um, easy to analyze as well, easier. Thank you so much, Lizzie. 
So back to EGLE. EGLE was obviously a step beyond the A-cluster randomized control trial as it was a step wedge dog leg design. Omar, could you explain the reason for this robust yet flexible study design that was used in EGLE? <clears throat> yes. Um, so a step wedge uh, cluster randomized trial, uh, trials, they are, you know, they're used in um, a wide range of areas of public health as well as, uh, as, well as other areas uh, such as uh, public uh, policy uh, and education as well. And uh, we can think of step wedge trials as, uh, as a modified um, crossover trial. Um, as the, you know, uh, the clusters are uh, both in, uh, are receiving uh, both treatment arms, uh, are in both treatments um, at different uh, time points. Uh, so similar to a crossover trials. So as you can see from the diagram here, we have um, sort of a, um, uh, the layout of a step wedge trial. Uh, so in the beginning, so period one, nobody, uh, you know, all the clusters received routine care or control. And as we go on, move on to the period, so when you uh, eventually we reach uh, period six, all the clusters will receive the intervention. So this is uh, very appealing because, uh, you know, uh, centers or hospitals are more likely to take part in the study because eventually they will uh, receive uh, the intervention. And the way that, um, that's decided, you know, which clusters, uh, you know, are in uh, which sequence. This, uh, this, uh, this will be decided uh, using randomization, so similar to cluster trial or similar to parallel groups uh, trial. Thanks, Omar. So, what would be the benefit of the stepped wedge approach? Yes, sometimes the rollout of an intervention might uh, necessarily be sequential because of limited resources or capacity to roll out the, uh, to the entire health system at the same time. So in these situations, a step wedge trial might be feasible, and you know we can uh, we can justify it based on you know, the need to stagger the rollout uh, for logistical reasons. And another main advantage is um, um, increased statistical power. So I've, a number of studies have shown that you know compared to uh, the normal cluster randomized uh, trial, the step wedge trial uh, will reach the desired statistical power with a fewer number of clusters uh, than a parallel uh, cluster uh, randomized trial. So, uh, you know, in fact, with a small uh, number of clusters, uh, you know, to achieve high power, you know, uh, high statistical power might not even be achievable in a parallel uh, cluster uh, randomized trial, but, you know, in a stepwise trial, uh, you know, we can, we can see, we can achieve uh, high power with uh, a few, uh, with a few or same number of clusters. Lizzie? Would you like to talk us through the slide? Yes, so this is a slide demonstrating the EGLE trial as a uh, incomplete step wedge trial. So uh, as Omar has mentioned, what this design means is that it has far higher statistical power for the same sample uh, of patients that we are going to recruit into the study, because we not only um, include, um, uh, take the measurement of uh, the, the, the normal outcomes uh, that the teams are providing, but also the after outcomes as well. So we take um, some pre and post intervention data from a small number of the uh, part participating hospitals. So whereas a standard uh, crossover or <clears throat> step wedge trial, we take either a before or after, um, or sorry, excuse me, a either control or intervention arm. With this particular design, we actually take a before, which we will call the control and also after the intervention. So, um, and this brings a lot of, um, again, practice, practicality in um, actually delivering the study when we're trying to recruit thousands thousands of patients and surgeons as well um, streamlining practicality and also maximizing the um, data set that we have is really key so what you can see here is in phase one we um, uh, have uh, the numbers at the very top demonstrate the sequence of randomization that we are applying um, to these hospitals and when a group of hospitals are ready to start the study, they are either randomized to sequence one, two or three. And sequence one, they start that period of time with an intervention. And then the next two following months, they are collecting data after the intervention. In sequence two, they start the first month with 
nothing at all with their normal practice. Then they start data collection before intervention. Then they do the intervention. And then they also do data collection after the intervention. And this similar sequence again um, in sequence three. So what the uh, groups are actually randomized to is which um, period of time they receive the data, uh, the intervention. Then after this particular phase is over, we move on to phase two. This is one month later in time, so it allows us more time to get sites ready and um, uh, local approvals in place. And then a further set of hospitals are then randomized into these three sequences. And this progresses through the rest of the study until we have a full data set. And this is how we were able to deliver Eagle. Wow, thank you, Lizzie. That's very insightful. Um, so maybe again, as a surgeon on the ground, how did you experience rolling out Eagle? So all of this complexity was um, dealt with by the central team, actually. This was all in the background behind the curtain. For the surgeons and for us, the patient facing um, people on the ground, it was actually very straightforward. We enrolled in the study and we were given the paperwork to be able to uh, attain local approvals. We were told we were being randomized and then we were told which sequence, either one, two or three, which we were randomized to. We were given the specific dates and what we needed to do during that period. And that was it. So very straightforward for um, uh, the participants and the collaborators that were involved in EGOM. And uh, a lot of this um, complex coordination was done by the central team. And uh, yes, that, that made it far easier. Thank you so much, Lizzie. Thank you so much, Omar. Your time is uh, much appreciated. Thank you for bringing this uh, insight in research methodology of the EGOM trial. We really appreciate it. And thank you to our delegates for joining this session. Thanks for having thank us. Bye. Welcome back, everyone. And uh, I hope you enjoyed your breakout sessions. Uh, I, I think, I hope we can all agree that the two combined impacts of trial methodology alongside process evaluation and implementation science are going to be fundamental to improving surgical practice across the world going forward. So I think we should, using Eagle as an example, we should be thinking, how can we now take this forward? And I'm going to turn to uh, Mary Venn. Mary, welcome. Uh, what are your thoughts about, can we implement these sorts of changes as we have in Eagle going forward, preferably long-term? Any thoughts about that? Yeah, I, I think there's lots of things that we can use. I think that um, study design feasibility is really important and having proven that Eagle's study design works is great. We also need to consider things like um, really as an incomplete design, the most, uh, the best way of, of rolling out education interventions and perhaps actually there's extra man work or extra work involved in doing an incomplete study design. So whether that pays off um, is up for debate, I think. Um, we've shown about educational engagement being um, possible and positive among surgeons. Um, and we've also shown that the online platform works. And I do think that that was helped by the pandemic rather than hindered. Um, I think we've made leaps and bounds with feasibility because of the pandemic and showing that batch designs work in normal and abnormal contexts. Um, but mostly, I think that the process evaluation has shown how important the community of practice is. And whilst we don't necessarily think that the, or not everybody thinks that attending the webinar is particularly important, and yet those people that have attended the webinars really value them because they can share with their colleagues and not feel isolated in their challenge or their difficulty. And whilst practical support is not always possible, sometimes it's just knowing that everybody else is experiencing the same barriers. Th thank you, Mary. Uh, Lizzie, Elizabeth Lee, uh, one of our lecturers. Lizzie, thank you for your lovely talk earlier on. Uh, what about, you, you had a lot to do with setting up the platform, the educational intervention. Do you think that kind of platform could be useful for surgeons going forward? 
Yes, absolutely. So um, the, the phrase that uh, I've come across recently is democratizing education and training and making it open access. Um, surgeons and any trainees or anyone is able to uh, access it in their own time when they need it, perhaps as well. So perhaps when they feel that moment on the learning curve and um, available across the world, it, it shares the best level of evidence and will incrementally improve surgical practice, I, I believe. Yes, thank you, Lizzie. I think that, uh, that, that we, we've, we've kind of come across this at the right time. It's a real pleasure to introduce Dr. Felix Eigner from uh, Austria, who is one of the PIs on Eagle. Felix, it's lovely to see you. Welcome to the webinar. Do you think these interventions like Eagle could be taken up in your hospitals in Austria and the surround? Great pleasure, Dion, to be on board. Thank you very much. So there are two things. First, uh, the, 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 the study design is a very, very sophisticated one, and it's up to you and the Global Search uh, collaborative team uh, who did an, an outstanding job to distribute this worldwide. So uh, by being asked if it could be implemented in Austria, yes, but only with your global support. I mean, that's true because there is a, a huge effort to, to distribute this. The other thing is, and, uh, and this is why I'm very keen on transferring these kind of studies into my uh, country, because we could show that the more the people engaged in uh, doing uh, colorectal surgery, but I think this counts for any type of surgery, the more they are engaged in quality insurance and improvement uh, sessions, the better the results. And this is a, a significant result you have shown us before that the anastomotic leakage is uh, significantly reduced. So it's up to us to add this kind of study and add this kind of training to our traditional styles, like uh, uh, training our trainees on the simulator or on uh, in the anatomic cadaver lab. This is a wonderful and outstanding uh, completion and addition to our standard and to our traditional training, which we should foster on, of course. But this is an additional uh, mode and congratulations again. Great job. Thank you, Felix. Um, Back to Kolkata, uh, Amrit, your, your thoughts about these kind of tools. Do you think these online training platforms could be valuable in India? Could, what would the uptake like be, do you think? Yeah, I think the online valuable tools are actually very nice for us when we, uh, which it helps us to uh, understand the nitty and also uh, learn, learn and unlearn th things which you are doing wrongly. So it actually helped us, although we are part of sequence three, and we had the intervention after the data was collected, but it helped us to know what mistakes we are doing and to help us improve that. So I think these studies in, a long, in the long run will help us improving the overall outcomes as we go about. Thank you, Amrit. Lovely to see you again. Uh, Professor Ung, from, now from Hong Kong, uh, is it possible that such interventions could be taken up and utilized in Hong Kong, Simon? So, uh, thank you very much, Dion. So, um, I think it's highly feasible because uh, for two reasons. One is, and as it, um, you know, the uh, the design, everything just reminded me of the time when we just started something like ERAS, right? So it's protocol driven. So we need to engage everyone in the hospital from a vertical, you know, top down and horizontal, you know, all the different specialties, including the nurses. So ERAS is very complicated. But, uh, you know, look at the ego protocol, the ego, you know, all the materials actually are very simple and straightforward and very user friendly. So with that, I think it's it's a highly feasible because we are quite used to this kind of engagement of the whole team of people. Second is I think uh, we, we, we also involve a lot of our trainees in the ego study. I think it's very important for them because in particular for all the emergencies, right, hemical activities, they are done by the trainees. So. For the trainees, I, I think this is a very good educational, you know, opportunity for them. All the online modules, all the materials are, you know, highly precious, all right, for the trainees. So for that reason, I think, and also in particular, when we have involved a lot of trainees in, in the ego studies, I think it's high, highly feasible. And congratulations to everyone for making this study a success. 
And it's not always the old men that you need to change because uh, we'll be gone soon. Sorry, I will anyway. Um, <laughs> but it's actually the next generation that we need to change. And actually, they are more receptive and it's a powerful way for long term change. So I think that's an incredibly important point you've just made. Omar, thank you for your presentation. I'm sorry about the, uh, so the the technical issue, but great presentation. Perhaps you just say once more, what do you think the greatest strength of this study design is? Yes, thank you, Dion. Um, <clears throat> although as a statistician, you know, I look at the dog leg design and see its efficiency and requiring less um, clusters compared to a cluster parallel trial. You have to look at the practical practicality of delivering uh, the study, you know, globally, and uh, the staggered recruitment, the the way that the study was set up. I think that was a major success, and it allowed us to roll out Eagle even during peak COVID. So I think uh, the practicality of the design, I think that that's what made it successful. Thank you, Omar. Uh, Mary, I'm going to give you the pleasure of the last word on this. Uh, we had a really good question online, which I know you and Lizzie have responded to. But the question was, uh, how, how are we going to disseminate these, this uh, tool beyond the study? What are we going to do now? Can we actually reach out to hospitals that weren't in the study? Mary? Yeah, I think so. I, I'm not sure of the timescale until our modules are relaunched um, but the idea is that those are launched for open access and people will be able to create their own account and track their own CPD and hopefully this will be a community that we can we can build on in the future. I think that the online education tools will be available within the next couple of weeks and we will make sure they are sent out to everyone who has signed up to the webinar so that we we will like all of our capacity building tools in the global surgery unit uh, we will be making sure they are open access and freely available to be used by institutions hospitals universities trainees even old men like me if we want to so i think that uh, that's a great philosophy to finish on so Thank you very much, everyone, for attending what has been a fantastic webinar. It's been some wonderful input from all across the world. So thank you to all of our colleagues and collaborators. Uh, of course, the Global Surgery Unit has many projects that are ongoing. And we'd just like to mention the latest project being launched, which is Gecko. And Gecko is a study of uh, laparoscopic surgery. It's being supported by one of our funders, the Wellcome Foundation. And the Gecko study is looking at the uptake of gallbladder surgery for cholecystectomy. It's one of the commonest elective operations in the world today. Uh, we are going to create a, a huge cohort study, which we will then use for a future Eagle study. So for people who are interested, uh, you can sign up uh, on the link you can see below. There's a barcode there in the right bottom right hand corner. If you want to flick your phones onto it, I'll just stay with that. We already have over a thousand hospitals have signed up to Gecko. It's going to be a huge study. We really look forward to sharing the results with you. And on that note, I'm going to close and say thank you to all of the participants and all of our friends from around the world. Thank you. Bye bye.